All right, everyone, welcome back. I'm Brent Weinberg from Learner Radiology. We're gonna keep talking about spine tumors today. Today we have a great uh, category. These are gonna be the intradural extramedullary lesions. If you haven't seen the other videos, including the overview and the intramedullary lesions, it's a great time to go back and check those out or check those out after this video. But today we're gonna to focus on the intradural extramedullary lesions. So today we're gonna to be talking about intradural extramedullary lesions. These are gonna be lesions that you know to be outside the spinal cord. And so here you see our, our drawing from earlier. The spinal cord is deflected to the side. So when you have a lesion that you believe to be outside the spinal cord, on axial images, it looks like this. You see the spinal cord is deflected to the side and you believe the center of the lesion is outside of the spinal cord. When you see this appearance, most commonly you're dealing with masses or tumors. A lot of these enhancing masses are schwannomas and meningiomas. Neurofibromas can have a little bit more variable enhancement. If you see multiple lesions, metastatic disease is what you really want to think about. Anything that diffusely affects the CSF can affect the intradural extramedullary space. That includes things like meningitis, neurocystis arcosis, arachnoid cysts, and those kinds of things. So any diffuse CSF process is intradural and extramedullary. Now, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, we use this term kind of generically. We're thinking about benign and malignant primary nerve tumors. These tend to be slow-growing tumors. They cause osseous remodeling. A lot of times they're centered in the neural foramen. They have pretty sharp margins and uh, they can cause denervation changes in the muscles. A lot of times they're associated with neurofibromatosis as well. This is a case of a schwannoma you see on the right here. You see an enhancing mass this is a post-contrast image centered in the neural foramen. You've got a component that's in the spinal canal. You've got an extra spinal component. Looks like you've got some erosions of the surrounding bone. That's an example of a schwannoma. Neurofibromas can be similar. A lot of times their enhancement will be variable, but it can be a little bit difficult to differentiate, particularly if it's solitary. Uh, these are usually less than five centimeters. The ones that are associated with neurofibromatosis are, can be more plexiform, and we'll see those in just a second. There's something called the T2 target sign. This is when the central portion of the neurofibroma has a T2 hypointense appearance. This suggests that you might be looking at a neurofibroma, but it doesn't really define uh, what, what you're seeing necessarily. Now, neurofibromatosis type one is a genetic abnormality. It's associated with a, gen a genetic mutation on chromosome 17. This is a syndrome that has neurofibromas, has associated scoliosis, duralectasia. Patients can have lateral meningocele's or areas where the meninges are protruding out of the spinal canal. Here you see, this is a coronal T2 image of some plexiform neurofibromas. What you see is many neurofibromas along the nerve roots. A lot of times they're flowing together. What makes a neurofibroma plexiform is that it involves more than one adjacent nerve root. So that's what you see here. Sometimes these neurofibromas can degenerate into malignant nerve sheath tumors. That's what you see here. Here you see an enhancing mass. It's got a centrally necrotic uh, region. So this is a very large region. And the key features you're looking for, if someone has degenerated, you're looking for one that's increasing in size pretty rapidly. You're looking for central necrosis. You're looking for evidence that the patient has pain. So these are features of malignant degeneration. Now, neurofibromatosis type 2 is associated with a different chromosomal abnormality, this one on chromosome 22. This one is more commonly uh, referred to as a, multiple, a syndrome of multiple masses. Another name for it is MISMI syndrome. That's multiple intracranial schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. These usually don't have plexiform neurofibromas, but they'll get these other masses. Intracranial schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas are all extramedullary intradural masses. So you can see a lot of these in NF2 patients. Now this is an example of a schwannoma. Here you have a T2, a T2 fat saturated and a post contrast fat saturated image. What you see is you see a well demarcated T2, slightly hypointense mass. So it's kind of similar to muscle, but darker than CSF. On your fat saturation, you actually see it even less well in this case, like it almost blends in with the CSF there. But on post contrast, you have avid enhancement, well defined margins, this one has a little bit of cystic degenerative changes in the center, which is very common for schwannoma. This is a typical appearance for what you might see with a schwannoma. Schwannomas are more common than solitary neurofibromas. 
The cystic changes and, like I said, uh, central non-enhancement are relatively common. Hemorrhage and calcification can happen, but they're relatively rare, so they're not common features there. About 15% of schwannomas are completely extradural, so they can be out here in the muscle or in the, in the sort of superficial soft tissue, so you can definitely see those. This is just another example of a schwannoma expanding the neural foramen with involvement of the spinal canal and extra canal soft tissues. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some intradural extramedullary cases. This is going to be case number one. This is a 74-year-old woman with pain in the left shoulder and arm. You have a fat saturated T2 image here showing a pretty well demarcated mass within the spinal canal. You see the dura is outside it. On post contrast fat saturated images, you see the same thing, a well demarcated mass, pretty homogeneous enhancement. And here are some axial images of the same thing. You have a T2. Here's your mass here. The spinal cord is deflected to the right. So you've got some pretty significant mass effect on the spinal cord there. On your post contrast fat saturated image, Again, on the axials, well-demarcated homogeneous enhancement. This is an example of a meningioma. Meningiomas are dural-based masses. They typically have avid enhancement. It's pretty frequent to have a lot of calcification. On diffusion-weighted images, they can have restriction because they're tightly packed cellular uh, components. Most of them occur in the thoracic spine, although you'll have some in the cervical and lumbar spine as well. They come in three grades, if you have a grade two or three. It will often be treated with radiation after surgery. This is an example of a calcified meningioma on a CT. Uh, here you see along the dorsal margin of the thecal sac a densely calcified mass. So that's a calcified meningioma. Now this is just an example of what we would call an in plaque meningioma. So rather than being rounded and uh, more focally mass-like, it's kind of along the entire length or longer length of the spinal canal. So here you see on a T2 image you've got this mass extending from about C2 to C4. It's sort of the T2 intermediate to dark. You can actually catch a little bit of the dura traversing through it. So this is partially intradural, partially extradural. On your post contrast images, you see avid enhancement, a little bit of scalloping or remodeling of the bone, these dural tails that kind of extend down here, and again, intradural and extradural components there. This was a 16-year-old boy who was having trouble controlling his right left arm for about a month. Now we're going to move on to case number two of our intradural extramedullary lesions. This is a 12-year-old boy with a new back pain. What you see here, you have a T2 image here. You see a well-demarcated lesion along the conus. The conus is probably about right here. On your pre-contrast image, you see a lesion that's relatively iso intense to the spinal cord which is right next to it on your post contrast image you see pretty avid enhancement of the lesion itself and again deflection of the spinal cord there this is an example of a mixopapillary ependymoma these are common extramedullary tumors most common along the conus and cauda equina usually young adults and uh, older children such as in this case the imaging tends to be lobulated expansile they usually have homogeneous enhancement. They can have areas of cystic degeneration and hemorrhage. This one didn't really have that much. These were previously called grade one tumors, but in the most recent WHO, they've been upgraded to grade two because they have high rates of local recurrence. This is gonna be a continuation of our case number two. What we have is routine follow-up on that previous patient about three years later. You have a pre-contrast and a post-contrast T1. One thing that stands out to you almost immediately is the marrow changes, but you see is fat deposition in the areas that were covered by radiation. So you know this patient has had prior radiation. On the post-contrast image, something that will stand out, you see a couple of areas of nodularity. So a little bit of nodular enhancement along the nerve roots of the cauda equina. Those are areas that there has been recurrence of tumor in those regions. Even though mixopapillary ependymomas are relatively indolent, they're really prone to local recurrence. And so that's, those are areas of local recurrence. But you don't want to stop there. If you take this patient got another MRI another year later, what you have is additional, you have a T2 uh, image and a post contrast image where you see a couple of additional nodular areas down here along the termination of the fecal sac here at S1 and S2, a nodule there and a nodule kind of filling the fecal sac. Again, like this is the areas where mixopapillary ependymoma has recurred. Uh, this is what it looks like when you get drop metastases from mixopapillary ependymoma. 
So like I said, mixopapillary pneumomas are not highly malignant, but they are prone to getting local and CSF recurrence, which is what has happened in this case. Things that can really help you out, okay, do your post-contrast images with fat saturation that will help you see those nodules. Remember to look at the entirety of the fecal sac. Don't get satisfaction of search when you see the recurrent nodules along the conus. Don't get too happy with yourself because there's some additional nodules more inferiorly. And look at the areas that are covered by radiation changes and particularly look at areas outside those radiation changes because those are going to be more prone to getting drop metastases. This case is an example of intradural leptomeningeal metastases from melanoma. Here we see a post-contrast and T2-weighted images. Uh, you have uh, nodules here along the conus. You see they enhance pretty avidly. You've got multiple. Anytime you see multiple intradural extramedullary lesions, metastases are going to be on your differential. Melanoma is relatively frequent, so you can definitely think about that. Now, this is a case of lymphoma. It's a 54-year-old with HIV and lower extremity weakness. We have a T2 with fat saturation image here. What you see is some irregularity along the catequina here, particularly from about L1 to L4, L5. On your T1, nothing's really standing out here except for maybe the CSF is not as dark as it should be. On your post-contrast image, this can be incredibly deceptive. We know this is post-contrast because the CSF is dark down here, but what you have is avid enhancement along all the nerve roots of the catequina. It's so much, in fact, that's encasing the conus. And so it's almost looking like a T2 weighted image because it's so bright in the CSF. Here's a DWI that goes with that. The conus and conoquina really shouldn't have diffusion restriction here. And what you see is the entire fecal sac here is, it has diffusion reduced material in it. That's the tightly packed cellular material from lymphoma. When you're thinking about leptomeningeal metastatic disease, there are a few diseases that are more commonly going to cause leptomeningeal metastases. In adults, that tends to be things like lymphoma, a couple of the common cancers like lung, breast, and melanoma. In pediatric patients, it's a little bit different. You have to think a little bit more about the intracranial lesions that are likely to have leptomeningeal spread. That includes things like medulloblastoma, pineal lesions, choroid plexus tumors. So these can commonly happen in pediatric patients. Here you see a patient that's had a relapse of their ALL. You see the nerve roots are very thickened, they're expanded, you've got expansion in the neural foramina here. You almost don't see any CSF here. This is a T2-weighted image, you should see more CSF there. So there's leptomeningeal spread of ALL all over the nerve roots of the, of the conoquina there. This is our third intradural extramedullary case. We're starting with some images of the brain. What we have is a 56-year-old man, he's got hearing loss, ataxia, backache, and incontinence. These are gradient or susceptibility-weighted images. What you see is some susceptibility along the sulci, particularly in the sylvian fissures along the surface of the cerebellum. That's superficial siderosis. So we're thinking this patient has something that's causing them to bleed into the CSF. If we take a look at their spine, so here's some images from the lumbar spine. We have an axial T2 weighted image here. The spinal canal is like really deformed. It's really odd looking. You, you can't even really make out the normal features. Here's your T2 with fat saturation. You have a lobulated mass. It's kind of filling the spinal canal here, causing mass effect. On your pre-contrast, it's pretty, pretty iso-intense to the disc, uh, but you can kind of see the margins there. On post-contrast, however, you can make out a pretty avidly enhancing mass, maybe a little bit of a degenerated area. But the other feature that really stands out here is you can see it on T2. You see a number of kind of serpentine T2 hypo-intense areas. You see it on the post-contrast as well. These are small vessels. They're filling with contrast. You've got a lesion. It's got a number of vessels around it. And so that's a nice clue as to what this abnormality is. This was a case of paraganglioma. Paragangliomas are neural crest tumors. They peak in middle adulthood. These patients can present with chronic pain and radiculopathy. These are hypervascular tumors that can have flow voids. They can have little areas of hemorrhage from siderosis. You can get bony remodeling around them. Maybe you see a little bit of scalloping of the vertebral body here. These can be positive on nuclear medicine scans, MIBG scans, and some of them have secretory activity. When you see, though, the imaging features are if you have something that looks like an appendymoma, but it has a bunch of flow voids around it, think about a paraganglioma. 
I haven't seen very many of these in my career. They're not very common, but it's something to think about if you see these types of lesions. This is our intradural extramedullary case four. It's a 51 year old man with lower extremity weakness. Supposedly he has this history of a known lesion is we have a T1 bright lesion. This is pre-contrast because we don't really see much filling of the venous plexus here. Uh, here we have a T2. You see something that the CSF is T2, but it's about ISO intense to CSF. Something that does catch our attention is a little bit of a rim of darkness around it. And on our fat saturated image, we see that near there's near complete suppression of signal within this lesion. Uh, so the, this right here, what we're seeing is a chemical shift artifact. And so what we're seeing is this is a lesion that contains fat. A fat-containing lesion along the conus can be a lipoma or a dermoid or teratoma. This one happens to be a lipoma. There it can be associated with tethered cords and cutaneous stigmata. But if you see a lesion that it has fat in it, so fat on MRI, think about this being a lipoma or a dermoid. Uh, that's the chemical shift artifact that you're seeing around the margins of, of this lesion. So that can be a clue that you're looking at fat as well. Another normal variant which can be similar to this is the fatty phylum terminale. Uh, what you see here on your T1 is you see a thin linear T1 hyperintense structure along the phylum terminale. On axial images, it looks like this. It almost looks like a nerve root, but it's T1 bright or it's fatty. This is a normal variant and appears in quite a number of people. So you'll see this relatively common. Uh, so don't get fooled by that and necessarily call all of those lipomas. In summary, we've taken a look at the intradural extramedullary lesions. The most common ones you have to think about are meningiomas, nerve sheath tumors. There are a number of less common masses, though, that can look like that. Ependymomas, metastatic disease, and drop mats, fat-containing lesions, uh, lipoma, or paraganglioma, which is your ependymoma that looks like it has flow voids. So this is what you should be thinking about. If you see a lesion that's intradural and extramedullary, and uh, so keep those things in your differential. Thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Uh, if you haven't checked out those lectures on the intramedullary lesions in the introduction, it's a great time to check those out. Our next lecture is going to be coming up. We're going to take a look at some of the truly extradural lesions. And so that'll be a nice way to complete your, your differential diagnosis for these kinds of lesions. Be sure to check out the rest of the videos on the channel. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Thanks for tuning in.